Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore some of the lessons learned from the U.S. government's 20-year experimental adventure in psychic espionage, Project Stargate. With me is Dr. Ed May, who was the research director of that program for 10 years from 1985 until it closed in about 1996. And uh, he was with the program for 10 years before that. Dr. May is an experimental physicist, and he is co-author of ESP Wars, East and West. He is also co-author of Anomalous Cognition, Remote Viewing, Research, and Theory. And he is the co-editor of a two-volume anthology of research papers titled Extrasensory Perception, Support, skepticism, and science. In addition, he is the recipient of a lifetime career award from the Parapsychological Association. Welcome, Ed. Thank you, Jeffrey. Pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to be with you. You know, this is now our 10th interview. Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's been a great pleasure doing all of them with you. I hope that people who view this one will take the opportunity to look at some of the others. Good. And I, I believe that this may be the most important of the 10, which is why we saved it for last, okay. I think. Well, I'll tell you, um, overall, what, what have we learned in 150 years of doing sci research? I think we should never, except for teaching reasons, ever do another random number generator experiment. <laughs> we should never ever do another remote viewing experiment, except for teaching mm -hmm. purposes. And we should never ever do, in some sense, psychophysiology experiments, because, for proof oriented, mm -hmm. I mean, because the data are in, and they are, at least in my view and many others, incontrovertible, meaning, uh, that is not the same saying, thing as saying that ESP re exists. It just says we have an anomaly in this data. We don't need any more data to prove that it's an anomaly. Mm -hmm. Even Ray Hyman, one of the chief skeptics of our field, agrees with that statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, given that we're not going to do that, except for teaching purposes, what's left to do? One whale of a lot. Yeah. And it's not clear to me the current generation of parapsychologists, or maybe even future ones, are in fact uh, uh, in a position to be able to do what's next. We need to know uh, neurophysiology. We need to know brain science. We need to have some challenging physics, which we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And most people who are involved in research parapsychology, including myself, are not equipped to do that. The amount of instrumentation that we knew to need to do the next step in neuroscience, nobody in parapsychology can afford it or has access to that stuff. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think that most parapsychologists, even the young ones coming up, need to do is to be able to school their students into how they can enter the mainstream and still bring some of their parapsychological uh, belief structure with them. Now, you were successful in doing that, uh, probably more than anybody else in the history of the field of getting mainstream support for, for your research, but most parapsychologists uh, are not able to do that. Yeah, that's a complex thing. I um, have written a paper on the idea, and, and it's very complex. Part of it is we as scientists are terrible at discussing the joy and the, the value of our data. And we argue about it, which good science do, but when we present it to the public, you know, well, I'm not sure it's really there, but mm -hmm. no, 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 that's not going to convince anybody. Yeah. And so what do you have to say? We have a fantastic phenomenon. If you don't think it is, demonstrate to me in an experiment that it's not real. And when mainstream people venture into that, that area, they say, wow, this is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been talking to mainstream people probably for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And with some exceptions, they say, no, wait a minute, you know, this is something weird. I'll tell you one story about a fellow, he's now deceased. He was a Nobel laureate. He invented the bubble, uh, the bubble chamber in, in physics. His name was Don Glazer. Mm -hmm. and I met him. 
You did? Yeah. Well, we were in holiday together in the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. And I sort of, and when I first met him, he asked what I did. And I never tell people what I actually did because it was classified most of the time. And I said, well, I'm a quantum physicist. I didn't know who he was at the time. He says, well, funny thing, you should say that. And mm -hmm. my wife is going, whack, whack, whack. Um, and so as we're being tourists around the Galapagos Islands, one night I said to him, you know, maybe I should tell you what I really did. And he got really interested. Mm -hmm. And the next thing, a few days, we're walking along and out in the middle of the Galapagos, he taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, have you thought of? Of course we thought of. It's kind of like taking a Nobel chemist and saying, did you remember to wash your test tubes? That's <laughs> kind of <laughs> the clever. Well, well but it is, it is because so many scientists assume that researchers in parapsychology must be idiots or fools. Right. Well, what's fascinating is one of the uh, leading critics of our field, uh, Ray Hyman, I went to the 20th Congress of Psychops, you know, into the lion's den of skeptics. Yes. And I watched <clears throat> Hyman from the stage say, do not underestimate parapsychologists. They are, and this is an exact quote, some of the best methodologists I know, end of story. Mm. And I went up to him afterwards and said, that was pretty brave of you in this <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> and you're right. And one of the reasons parapsychologists are so good at their methodology is everybody's clobbering them. Yeah. They have to be holier than thou to do their work. Mm -hmm. But we have reached an impasse in our field because um, with all good intentions, you need more than that to take the next step. We're victims of our own success because we don't have to prove anything anymore. We now have to try to understand what's going on. And to take that next step requires a lot more training than I have for sure. And it requires a lot more uh, access to instrumentation, which is not easy mm -hmm. to come to in our field. Well, the conventional wisdom for people entering the field, the yeah. wisdom I never followed, but you certainly did, <laughs> is to really? get your credentials in yeah. some more conventional field, yes. get established in a conventional field, and then you can begin to branch out in parapsychology once you're uh, secure professionally. Right. Well, there's there's some sociological pressure, which is not our fault. Mm -hmm. I have a dear friend who's uh, got her degree in, in neuroscience and is a very competent neuroscience scientist. Mm -hmm. But she started allowing people to realize her interest in this area and went on some questionable websites with some Indian guru types. Mm -hmm. She can't get a job cannot get a job because she's been associated with the wacko types. Yeah. And that's not fair to the wacko types because they're really not wacko, mm -hmm. but the mainstream science thinks they are. Yeah. And, you know, I have great sorrow for this person, you know. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we've got to be in the closet a bit further. Mm -hmm. And as we begin to make inroads, and I'm not the only one, making inroads into the mainstream people getting interested in this, that will become easier and easier and easier to collect people. Because one of the problems we have overall you can't make a living as a 100% parapsychologist. And so if you're a competent young neuroscientist and you have an interest in this, I would advise them, do not come into parapsychology. Get your, as you said earlier, get your real degree in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. and I did it in physics, not because I hope that's how I'd get into parapsychology. I'd never heard of parapsychology yeah. until well, way late. As somebody who didn't follow that advice, yeah. uh, and honestly, I, I don't regret my own path. I noticed that other people who come to parapsychology out of mainstream psychology or physics mm -hmm. have less of an appreciation, I think, for the history of the field oh, very definitely. as a whole. That includes me. I, I know very little about the history of the field. Uh -huh. um, and th that's a, a challenge for people. Uh, look, at the end of the day, doing parapsychology experiments is not rocket science. It's easy compared mm. to trying to understand the genetic history of a rabbit. Mm. It's much harder. Or neuroscience. You know, yeah. people like to say, "Well, it's not rocket science." Actually, rocket science is pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is not hard? What is not easy is neuroscience. <laughs> it's a wrong metaphor. <laughs> rocket science is not rocket science. Yes, yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about applications. Okay. That's the Stargate program was primarily an applications program, it, and yeah. it seems to me, as you've pointed out, we no longer need to prove the reality of, of the phenomenon. We need to understand it better, but I think that um, we're in a position where we can also develop new applications, wouldn't you say? That's a tricky case. Um, one of the problems with people interested in uh, application of parapsychology, they think, oh, I've got a miracle. Can I think of an application for a miracle? I'll mm -hmm. think I'll levitate a monk to, no, <laughs> to the moon. 
the, we tend to, as a discipline of parapsychologists, overestimate the quality that can come by psychic information. Right. We really do. Mm -hmm. uh, one one minor one one exception to that is what's called associational remote viewing. Mm -hmm. You can take some pretty crummy remote viewing and turn it into an application where it really produces actually winning money. Mm -hmm. And there are groups of people who believe that we can influence the the mainstream people by coming away with hundreds of millions of dollars or whatever it's going to take, mm -hmm. winning by sports betting using uh, psychic yeah. ability. Or the stock market. Or the or stock market, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I hope that's successful. It's a very difficult way to go. Mm -hmm. um, John McMonagle works for the police departments, often. Mm -hmm. And I think Marcella Truzzi wrote a book, I've forgotten the name the of it. The Blue Sense. The Blue Sense. And, you know, police departments are happy to use psychics. Yeah. Either they're murderers or psychic. <laughs> Can't tell. <laughs> now, if, if they find a, a missing a, body, for ex example, yeah. it, it has happened that uh, psychics on occasion have, have been accused of uh, yeah. Being the uh, criminal. Oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> it's happened. Oh, poor people. Yeah. I feel sorry. They've had to say, no, I'm really a psychic. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> a murderer or a psychic. That's, you know. <laughs> but the serious part how to move forward. Why should, first of all, why? Why Why don't we quit? This is tiny phenomena, it's weak phenomena, it's uh, on the edges of understanding things, but that's not really correct. Mm -hmm. Our technology will get at a deeper understanding about space and time through precognition. Mm -hmm. Is it going to change everything we know about physics? No. No new advance in physics has changed everything. Some of it has been really philosophical big, yeah. like quantum theory versus quantum mechanics, but it doesn't change your pool game. Mm. It doesn't play change how you play football. The mm -hmm. lived experience of quantum mechanics doesn't exist. Well, it sounds to me as if, if you had to say, uh, one thing that really excites you about the uh, future of the field, it's the interface with neurophysiology. Sure, that's one, one of only one direction. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big one. And so it'll teach us about our brains, maybe an aspect about our brains that have been bypassed. Mm -hmm. Is it going to change our whole structure of consciousness? I actually doubt it. Mm. it. It might push it a little bit in one direction or another. Just because these things that we adventure into new applications um, using psi may not change the whole history of everything. There's a phrase in Silicon Valley, which I don't like, this will change everything, and it almost never does, uh -huh. except the iPhone did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so, but it doesn't mean, therefore, it's not valuable. Yeah. I mean, some of the smallest things that are extremely important to understanding nature and physics are exquisitely tiny and hard to measure, mm -hmm. and they turn out to be very, very important trying to understand how the world works. Now, let's look at it. We have physics. Okay. There's, we have a lot of things to say about that. Yeah. Psychology. Maybe there's a real big interface between the psychological counseling and psi, and people have looked at that at some bit. Philosophically, maybe mm -hmm. it has, we have a lot to say about the nature of philosophy. Um, psychophysiology, can the, can the body respond to a, a future stimulus? Mm -hmm. And many experiments seem to think that. And we might even address the big question of uh, non-material versus material consciousness and spirituality. Mm -hmm. And we are developing a toolkit that might help us address some of these things. And frankly, the collection of parapsychologists, including myself today, are not equipped to take that next mm -hmm. step properly. Well, I know you um, still have some big plans of your own yes. in, in terms of the research you'd be yeah, interested in doing next. Yes. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, you know, um, we've talked a lot in some of the earlier discussions we've had about a model of precognition. And in there, there is in the neuroscience domain some very exquisitely testable things none of which am I capable of doing on my own or mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. So I've been able, to, been lucky to dealing with some neuroscientists scientists, and we have some, hopefully, a hook into getting some rather substantial amount of money to do that. And I can't mention their names right now until we actually yeah. get the thing in progress. But the, the point here, if I understand you, is that parapsychologists are likely to uh, advance their field and, and gen knowledge in general the most by working in interdisciplinary teams yeah, with specialists so. from many other fields and, and contributing their part. Yeah, I benefited immensely by that. At the height of our program, I had $2 million a year of the funding, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I had 12 full-time people with a variety of, of disciplines. Mm -hmm. And we made more progress than, like, like any group that does. Working alone in one lab and somebody else working alone in another lab, that's a very 
unproductive way to go about it. On the other hand, interdisciplinary research can be very frustrating and very inefficient mm -hmm. because uh, on the one hand, you're not constrained by the rules I know to be true in physics and um, maybe I'm not constrained by talking to a psychologist by the rules he knows must be mm -hmm. so we can really feed into each other. Yeah. But it's very inefficient because I'm sorry, those rules have never been violated and they're not going to be <laughs> violated now. <laughs> Move on. <Yeah. laughs> so it's a complex thing. but worthy of the journey. We really need to go after it. Mm -hmm. Well, back to practical applications uh, okay. for a moment. Yeah. Uh, I, I know the one thing you you seem to be saying is don't get your hopes up too high here. Yeah. That uh, uh, in spite of uh, some of the enormous successes I know you've had in, in Stargate, you, you have a great appreciation for the many uh, times that uh, the projects failed. That we learn almost, in fact, we learn more from the things that fail. In fact, neurophysiology, brain science, has learned most about the things from pathology. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, science learns from its mistakes and its, you know, blind alleys, mm -hmm. including us. Still, with regard to practical applications, do you, would you advise, for example, uh, governments to be involved in the future and, and, and to, uh, initiate new programs uh, uh, for psychic espionage? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, yes, well, let's hope they're still doing it. I don't think they are, but I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, because it's it's cheap and safe. Uh, General Savin, General Alexei Yodorovich Savin ran the, gov the Russian remote viewing program for a whole bunch of years, and he had 200, 120 remote viewers. Mm -hmm. And he takes his remote viewers to the battlefield in Chechnya. Mm. So I said, hey, Alexei, uh, what about remote? What don't you understand about remote and remote viewing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have to take them. He says, oh, but it really motivates, motivates them. Mm -hmm. Well, we can argue about whether that's true or not, but they were on the front line. They had to learn weapons, hand-to-hand -hand, uh, hand -hand combat. Uh, Elena Klimova had to learn how to drive a nuclear sub. Oh, mm -hmm. What? Why are they doing that? Well, uh, do you have information that they got good data that way? Um, that's a tricky, interesting question. The short answer is no, but there's a but. Um, they may not be willing to share it with me. Uh, I do have direct experience with Elena Klimova as one hell of a good remote viewer. I ran a remote viewing trial. No, one trial doesn't prove anything, mm -hmm. but she was really good. Well, that says something. Yeah, right. And I know that you and General Savin wanted to work together jointly yes. to have a, a U.S. Russian mission using remote viewers to help uh, the counterterrorism effort. Yes, and what was a big surprise to us is Savin, who was still in the military at the time, said, um, take all the pictures you want. And by the way, here's my organization chart, all the things we had dreamed about when we were spying on him. <laughs> He's handing to me, you know, yeah. really. And he asked me to write up what's called an intelligence contact report, where he knew that I would. Mm -hmm. And I handed that to the three-star uh, admiral in charge of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Mm -hmm. I said, this guy in Russia wants to go forward. It's inexpensive. It's safe. No one's going to be in harm's way and critical if it's handled right. Mm -hmm. He looked at it and said, thank you very much. I walked out the door and I'm sure it landed in the circular file. Nothing happened. Well, do you think that was a mistake on uh, his part? Absolutely a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's not that, again, it's like any application. We are not going to solve an intelligence problem in and of itself. But nor should any uh, collection asset solve an intelligence problem by itself. But we never have an opportunity to integrate what the, the psychics do with the rest of the intelligence community. Because mm -hmm. it was sort of, they only gave us the impossible problems to solve, and the fact that we solved a reasonable fraction of them is itself a miracle. Mm -hmm. Well, supposing a, a person who is a government decision maker mm -hmm. is uh, able to watch this video mm -hmm. right now and uh, says to themselves, gee, too bad that uh, the individual that you uh, pursued 
back then didn't take the uh, possibility further, but maybe they would like to. Uh, is it still uh, possible for U.S.-Russian cooperation in today's environment? Absolutely. We're trying to set it up now. I'm, getting, I'm putting together an email list server of younger people, including now Sabin, who's a little bit between my age and yours, uh, wants to move forward with it. Mm -hmm. we, we spent a lot of time. I was in Moscow in, in December, and we spent a lot of time planning what the future might look like, including that. Mm -hmm. Because in counterterrorism, which is a big problem all over the world, yeah. we're not going to solve that per se, but we'll get clues to help other people mm -hmm. solve the problem. Now, I know you have been all over the world traveling and lecturing about the work that you've done. Do you see the possibility for cooperation uh, with other countries? Uh, in the UK, for sure. Um, there's a language barrier. I was invited to join a Russian uh, uh, solid-state physics lab to spend time there to try to build a psychic ship. Mm. And that never came about because there was big la language problems and money problems and so on. We desperately need some serious funding. And when I mean serious funding, I'm not talking about $50,000 from the BL, Corp or BL Foundation. Mm -hmm. That won't help much. We need something like anywhere between 10 and $20 million to do the job correctly. And in terms of overall big programs, that's cheap. Yeah. But it's impossible for most of us parapsychology types. Well, you certainly have had contracts uh, in that range yeah. in the past. So uh, the possibility of that happening in the future isn't. Uh, unthinkable. It's absolutely not unthinkable. In fact, um, there are a number of organizations. One I'll mention, um, if you go online, look at the McDonald S. Uh, uh, the James S. McDonald Foundation. Mm -hmm. They are willing to fund up to, up to six to seven million dollars for some creative research in cognitive science. So if you had to um, choose between pursuing uh, for the rest of your career, and I know you're still active, uh, between doing applied work, operational yeah. projects versus uh, research, pure research, you you lean towards pure research. Well, not only lean to it, I don't, don't want to do applications for the military anymore. Uh -huh. it's, it's a younger person's job. Okay. I mean, in other words, you think it's worthwhile for oh, the right younger people, but not, absolutely. not yeah. for you. Because it's something you can't waltz in and do and then leave. You know, I'm going to waltz in, I'm 76 years old, how much time do I have left? Mm -hmm. But who's somebody who's like 30 or 40? can have a whole career doing that, and that's yeah. what you need to do it. But, you know, truly, somebody who's 30 or 40 just yeah. getting into the field could benefit greatly from the knowledge and experience you've accumulated over the last two, three decades of uh, your work, Well, your Jeffrey, career. you've gone a long way with this 10 interviews we've done. Hopefully, someone will be encouraged about it. Yeah. I hope that somehow when you uh, publish these, you can give them my email address. And if you're interested in talking to them, oh, yeah. I'm open to talk There, to There them. will be links to your website. Oh, good. And, uh, people can find that by going to the uh, listings page that yeah. they can get right from the uh, uh, homepage at newthinkingaloud.com mm -hmm. for, for those who might want to <laughs> well, go there so. right now. You know, I get contacts uh, letters. Yeah. Uh, well, let me re reinverse that. I just came from a medical conference uh, in Porto, Portugal on the, on the um, uh, placebo effect. Mm -hmm. And a whole bunch of people, uh, mainstream MDs, were really excited, really, we exchanged cards, blah, blah. Yeah. I write them a letter, I never hear from them again. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what that's about. Maybe it's uh, about the field or what have you, but they find maybe it's risky. I just don't know. And these are people from all over the world. Well, there's still a stigma yeah. associated. The, and people are looking at the placebo effect, let us say, from mainstream medicine. Yeah. And it doesn't occur to them that there might well be a, a parapsychological component. They may even feel threatened by that. Well, the interesting you say that, Jessica, it's professor of statistics gave an absolutely brilliant talk introducing parapsychology to this group of people and said, all right, I know it's hard to believe, but let's assume that it were true. If it were true, here are its here is its impact to your areas of study. Mm -hmm. Now, the only exciting thing that happened, I met a, one of those mainstream guys from Harvard, and he said, um, okay, you do weirder stuff than we do, and nobody accepts our work. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, really? Yeah. So I said, what's your problem? He said, well, 
Big Pharma thinks we're pr- trying to put them out of business with pharma- with the placebo effect. Yeah. And the whole conference demonstrated that that's not the case. And I said, the mistake you guys have is you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's and publishing in mainstream journals, and that does not get even address the issue of what your problem is. Your problem is you've got to convince the Big Pharma that you're not putting them out of business and you need to invite them in and join you. He said, oh, I never thought of that. Mm-hmm. He said, well, what's your problem? I said, our problem is philosophical. People reject what we do from a philosophical basis. That's a much harder thing to overcome. Mm-hmm. Now, Max Planck, one of the co-founders of quantum theory, has a very famous statement, which I think you know. New ideas are adopted in physics, not by the force of the, are their arguments, but the old people die, and the young ones come along and have never heard the old idea. Yeah, that, that <laughs> certainly seems to be the case. But now, with regard to the people who have, uh, who think that parapsychology is impossible because of their philosophical belief, mm-hmm. generally these people are philosophical materialists and anyone listening to our interviews would know that you consider yourself a uh, right. physicalist or a materialist uh, and yet you don't see the same conflict that they see. Well, most of the people I talk to because I'm a materialist, they're willing to pay attention to me. Uh-huh. You know, if you're a materialist mainstream neuroscientist, well, what you don't you're not proposing um, um, incense and and you know non-material consciousness. You, you're you're putting this all in the physics physiology range. Oh, maybe I should pay attention. Well, it sounds like uh, what you're saying is that if parapsychologists really want to reach out to the mainstream, they ought to rethink their uh, opposition to materialism. I think so. At least be open to all possible uh, those points of view. Part of the overall, uh, I gave a paper once <clears throat> about what's wrong with our field, and it was pretty grumpy. <laughs> but the, but the, the idea is we're terrible salespeople of what we do. You know, uh, if, if you're trying to convince a room full of uh, neuroscientists, you don't go say, you know, everything you know about neuroscience is wrong and let me educate you. That's not a very good sales technique. Mm-hmm. But I'm afraid collectively we do that or yeah. some, some variation on that theme. Well, that is a very good point to end this uh, fascinating inter- interview and fascinating series of interviews with Ed May. This has been a great pleasure. Thank you. It has for me, too, Jeffrey. I really appreciate it, and thank you. And thank you, too, for being with us. Thank you.